Go. Okay, I declare our meeting now open. Um, can I just advise members that we, well, along with myself, there are two other members in the room, and that is the Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong and Andy Allen. And then on Fias Starleaf, we have Mark Durkin, Carol McKillen, Fra McCann, Robin Newton, and Jonathan Buckley. So they're all very welcome. Uh, members, as this is our first time using this star leaf, so I uh, just ask you to be patient, especially with me. Um, it's all a bit new and a bit technical for us today. Um, can I just remind you um, that you have to be invited to speak on the star leaf as well? Um, so if you want to speak, please press the raise your hand function um, to alert us that you do want to speak. And if for whatever reason your question has been asked or you no longer want to um, ask that question or no longer want to speak, you can then lower your hand on that function. Um, also, anyone using Starleaf on their mobile phone or, or phoning in only, um, you don't have that facility to put your hand, up, your hand up, so you will have to indicate in some other way. I think the only one that is uh, is that will be Robin. So Robin, I'll come to you and ask you if you want if you want to ask anything. Um, Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, I'll also tell. I'll also let you know what, what the witnesses when I'm bringing them in as well. And lastly, when I invite you to speak, can you wait for a few seconds for the camera and microphone to be activated and selected before you begin to speak? A bit like in the assembly chamber, um, once you're called to speak, just give it a, a second or two um, to allow that to kick in. And um, you don't need to activate or deactivate your microphone. This will all be done and controlled by assembly broadcasting, um, taking any of their cues from me to bring you in and speak. So is that all crystal clear or as clear as mud? Everybody okay with that? Yes. <coughs> Yep. All agreed? Yep. Okay. Then we'll just begin the meeting then and we'll go straight into agenda item number one. Our first uh, item is apologies and we have an apology from Sinead Innes. And I know Mark is not present at the moment. He had to take a phone call, but he will be back joining us. And Robin, you've also told us that you may have to leave early as well. So that's apologies done. Agenda item two is chairperson's business. I don't have any business that I need to speak to you about. I'll move on then to agenda item three, which is the draft minutes. Um, members will find the minutes of our last meeting held on the 3rd of June. They're at page six of your meeting pack. Can I then first ask members in the room, are they content with the minutes as drafted? Agreed. Great. I'll then um, ask members on Starleaf, are you content with the minutes as drafted? Agreed. 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 Yes. Okay. Thank you. Agreed. I'll then move on to item number four, which is matters arising. Um, members, there are so many um, departmental replies to consider. I thought it would be best that if we leave this to after um, the briefings, which, uh, uh, because there, there is a lot, of, a lot of items there that members want to bring up. I think that would be better. We'll leave it then to after we have our two briefings. Members agreed with that? Okay. Agreed. All right. We'll move Great. then on to then agenda item five, which is a departmental briefing on current and future support for councils. Um, members, you have been provided with a briefing paper at one page one three two of your committee packs, and um, and queries on financial support for local councils at page one three six. Um, I'm just saying, do we have the witnesses, Mark O'Donnell and Anthony Carleton? Mm. Are you both present? Bring them in. Mark and Anthony, are you there? Yeah, can we bring Anthony and Mark into the spotlight? Yeah. Okay. Mark and Anthony, hi. I can see us now. You're both very welcome. Thank you for <coughs> Thank you. Um, joining Thank us you. today. Um, Mark, could you then go ahead and begin your briefing? Oh, okay. Will do. Well, first of all, thanks very much for inviting Anthony and me today to brief you on the, the support packages that the department has, has introduced for councils. I, I just plan to give you some detail on the process uh, behind our allocation of that COVID funding and um, just a few words about the department's ongoing work with them to deliver the food box program. Um, so if that's all right, just uh, I'd say despite the, the COVID pandemic, we all know that councils continue to play an essential role in delivering services to the community. The restrictions that were introduced and they had the clear purpose of protecting life and ensuring that the health service wasn't overwhelmed. They also created a severe financial challenge for the 11 councils. So 
they've lost practically all of their self-generated income through the closure of council facilities. Um, the, the Society of Local Authority Chief Executives, NI, so that's SOLAS, and the Association of Local Government Finance Officers um, estimated that for the period between the 1st of March and the 30th of June, the financial impact uh, resulted from a number of things. So that was the closure of leisure, tourism, arts, culture, and community facilities. Uh, no fees for planning and building control. Um, loss of their revenue from the off-street car parking charges and some other environmental income and licensing and enforcement. Uh, they also had to incur further costs, direct costs, um, to councils of responding to the emergency itself. So that was things like costs associated with the community response initiative, um, costs associated with cemeteries, um, getting hold of IT equipment to enable the remote working of staff and members, um, and additional cleaning and protective equipment. So those costs and some projections on the savings available to councils through the coronavirus job retention scheme, which is the, the furlough scheme, they've all been verified for us by council chief executives. But this information was provided to the department so that we could develop a bid for funding to the Department of Finance. So as, as members will know, on the 19th of May, the Minister of Finance made an oral statement in the Assembly, and he said that 20.3 million would be provided to DFC to support all local councils that have delivered these vital services throughout the, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, we did <clears throat> due diligence of the income figures provided by councils, uh, and that was provided to us via SOLAS and the Association of Local Government Finance Officers. Uh, and it's now been agreed with, with SOLAS that the allocation of the 20.3 million of executive funding um, was uh, able to be distributed to councils just last week. Uh, in terms of that due diligence process, the total financial loss figures were tested against the equivalent income for the corresponding period for 2019. And those have all been signed off by the individual council chief executives personally. The, uh, the confirmed figures provided a basis for the distribution of the funding that was consistent with the bid that we made uh, to DOF and that was approved by the executive. Uh, and the basis for all of that was just that it looks to assist councils with income lost and additional costs as a result of, of COVID. So this 20.3 million should ensure that councils can continue to provide those ongoing essential services uh, to those, particularly those in need. Um, it helps councils with their cash flow in the here and now, uh, but it also, we think, ensures that they're ready to play their key role in the post-pandemic recovery. Uh, and it limits the financial impact then that has to be borne by local ratepayers. <clears throat> um, just in terms of the furlough scheme, DOF confirmed at the start of May that councils could apply to the furlough scheme to furlough their staff um, where there has been income loss as a direct result of COVID. Now that furloughing process is directly between each council and HMRC, and it doesn't involve DFC, so we know approval process, um, but we are keeping track of um, the success or otherwise of councils in, in furloughing their staff. And we're aware that councils have been making the claims accordingly, um, and that's, that's happening on a, on a monthly basis. I think that ensures that the rights of workers are respected and the jobs are protected. Um, with the outbreak of COVID, there's those who received shielding letters from their GPs and along with others who are vulnerable, they're required to stay at home. So they can't get out for food, or um, in some cases, they can't secure other means of accessing food, whether that's through online delivery or family and friends. Um, and obviously, access to food is a critical element of the emergency response to this crisis. Uh, there's a, a number of strands of the overall emergency response program that relate to food support. For some, for some people, it could be support through a community group or a food bank, and for others, it could be connecting them to a volunteer to deliver their shopping. So my colleagues in the engaged communities group, part of the department have provided financial support also to councils to deliver directly or enable that important work 
of local voluntary and community organizations at the grassroots level. Um, and to date, one and a half million has been distributed to the voluntary and community sector through councils, um, which included an element for that food program. Um, alongside all of that, there was an urgent requirement to secure a regional supply through contracts with food suppliers to deliver food boxes for that uh, that vulnerable group that I've talked about. The, the food boxes are being delivered to council-based distribution centres and from there they're distributed direct to people's homes and that's normally through a, through a strong partnership that includes the local government itself, other statutory organisations, health trust mainly, and uh, the community and voluntary sector partners. So local knowledge within the, the councils and those statutory agencies and the community organisations are really important information channels to enable that initiative to succeed. Um, so uh, I hope that's helpful alongside the briefing paper that we've provided and thanks for the opportunity just to set it out in advance. Anthony and I will try and answer any questions that, that you might have for us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mark, for your briefing and thank you for the paper. I know certainly a few weeks ago, whenever we had um, been hearing as, uh, as local MLAs from our various councils, there was great worry. And certainly whenever we had the solace briefing, there, there, we were, there was major concern around how our, our local councils were going to function going into the future. Um, I know from hearing back from some of the, the leaders with, uh, within um, my own party on various councils, that there has been a very positive response to this. Um, the, that um, certainly looking at, at the, the table and the figures that you've provided, um, it seems to have been uh, split very equally amongst all of the councils in and around 60 per cent of their, their, their total um, they appear to have received. So um, I think that that has been good. Um, and thank you for that. And I know, again, speaking to my, my party colleagues who are leaders on some of those councils, um, they have also commented that the ongoing work between the department and the councils at the moment is excellent, and that there, that, you know, that there, that you seem to be, uh, if not on a daily basis, nearly contacting most of the councils to find out how they are, uh, which is great. So I have to, I have to say, well done, and you know that it really has turned a corner for many of the councils. This help, along with the furlough, certainly as well. Just a couple. Of of wee questions that I wanted to ask you then. I, I suppose um, looking at the table here and you had mentioned there the chief executives had signed off on, on all of their the, on their submissions and it's just around revised lost income. Is that different to the actual submissions they put in? Um, and I know it's very much based on the figures for 2019, you know, and <coughs> the figures for 2019 can't lie because they're audited figures um, of, of what their income would have been for that period. So it's just really, is there a difference between what chief executives maybe initially put in for and then the revised figure? And then also want to ask you around um, our, the next period then from July to October. And as you know, we will have solace in again with us at the end of the month. Um, just asking them, um, just have you any indications as yet of what um, that figure might look like for the next quarter? Um, I'd imagine that some of those services in some of those areas with maybe tourism um, starting to pick up again from the end of July. I know some of the councils own caravan sites and things like that. Um, those losses maybe shouldn't be so great going forward. So I suppose just to start off with those couple of questions, Mark, if you would. Okay. Um Sure. The, the revised figure, um, the, we just use that term as the, the figure post the due diligence process. So there was a fair bit of to and fro um, asking some questions, probing a bit. Some of the figures came up and some came down. I think as much as anything, that just reflects that uh, when we asked initially for figures, they were based on estimates from councils because there, there was a there was a degree of urgency to get those figures into the the bid uh, that was relayed to the Department of, of Finance. So whenever that bid was submitted, there was a bit more time to actually get beneath the, the original um, figures. Uh, as, it, as it turns out, the, the difference between the revised figure and the original estimate wasn't that great. Um, so in some cases, the the, um, the figure would have gone up in other cases it, it came down so there was there was a bit of of just sharpening up the the figures that happened um, by the the councils themselves um, a bit on our part of um, 
the the, the figures um, were maybe um, submitted originally in a slightly different basis across other all, all council areas. So if a, if a council, for example, was saying this is our 12 month projection for loss, we would have asked them to go back and, and bring that down to the March to June figure for loss. So that explains, um, I hope, some of the, the difference between or why there was a difference between the revised and initial figure, but the the revised figure was was the one that the um, the council chief executives were were happy to to stand over. Um, your your second question there was around the period from the end of this month looking forwards. Um, I I don't have a, a figure for that. I'll, I'll maybe ask Anthony if he wants to to comment on any figures that are emerging. I'm not sure if they are as yet, but um, we have, um, we've been aware from the outset of, of this that the COVID emergency wasn't going to be finished by the by the end of June. Um, so we we have, would certainly anticipate that the councils would come forward to us with another, um, another estimate maybe of their loss of income and their ongoing costs. Um, a bit like before, we don't have any baseline provision for funding councils at that level. So it would be a matter of us um, putting a bid together. And if our if our minister was agreeable, then submitting it to the Department of Finance for consideration. But we know that councils are working on that currently. And um, we, <coughs> we've advised the Department of Finance that while we don't have a figure for it that they should expect something to come forward from us um, towards the end of this month. Anthony, is there anything maybe you want to add to that? Uh, no. Uh, hold on, am I, am I can we heard okay? Yeah. Yeah, we can see you. Go ahead, Anthony. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Mark's quite right. We have really only started our work on the second quarter. We would expect uh, some of the costs obviously to come down because. You know, some of the obviously the cemetery costs likely won't be needed again. The initial setup costs for the IT, some of those issues will drop out, and hopefully, um, with the easing of some restrictions, possibly the loss of income through uh, tourism and 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 other uh, fee generating um, activities on councils will pick up a bit. But also, the work is really only starting on that now that we have we have concluded the the first claim and established. A fairly robust mechanism of uh, the the format that the, the department's happy enough to see the numbers in the format the the council are happy enough to supply them, uh, and therefore we're working ahead very quickly uh, with councils now on, on what they see as their potential costs for the second quarter. I suppose just to comment on that as well from from the, any feedback that I have certainly received, and as again I said, we will be hearing from Solace. At the end of the month, um, I mean that relationship between the department and uh, the the financial part of council seems to be a pretty good relationship and an open relationship. So there should be no nasty surprises as we go along for the department, um, because it, it does appear that you you know that you, you do have a, a good working relationship with the councils at this time. So that's a positive, and I think uh, you know that needs to be commended um, for that also. So it's just a case then of of maybe just watching and waiting now. Um, going forward as the financial position of councils. Um, members, I'm going, I have maybe a couple more questions, but I'm going to leave those. I'm going to go um, to who has signalled. So I have, first of all, Johnny Buckley has signalled he wants to speak, and then um, Kelly. So we'll go to Johnny first. Just give it a moment, Johnny. Thank you, Chair. Can everyone hear you? Yes, can indeed. Yep. Well, thanks to Mark and Anthony for their presentation. I suppose probably initially just want to say that as was briefed by the was said by the chair and indeed the initial solace briefing, um, whatever amount of funding was received was probably never going to be enough in terms of the need and requirement that councils have. So, like all of COVID funding right across all the departments, I think that's a common thread of of the situation that we find ourselves in. I suppose I, I did have some concern and confusion around the processes concerning the total of funding allocated and how it was allocated to each council. You, you have allayed some of those concerns, but it would just maybe like you did to, to, to further probe on in terms of what checks and balances are involved uh, to, engage, to ensure councils have followed proper guidelines. Because you talked about, and the chair had mentioned, the revised uh, income loss. 
Uh, you talked about the to and fro in between the department and the councils in relation to that. And I would just like to know maybe a wee bit more as to um, how, how you come to uh, that revised income. Is that then agreed by the chief executives uh, following the submission? And then on the other point was the revised COVID cost. Who, who actually arrived at that figure? Was that a, the same process as the, the income? So perhaps you could maybe answer those couple just for, to get me a, a bit more understanding of the processes in around that um, figure that was was a finally a, arrived at before I move to my next question. Okay, do, do you want me to start with that, Chairman? Go ahead. Um, okay, the um, I suppose the the overall process. Um, we, we asked councils to, to tell us, as I was saying, that the loss of income and their additional costs, um, that brought us to a figure um, sort of north of 40 million, if I remember correctly. And then we, we said to them, um, can you give us an estimate of your um, savings that you would be able to generate if you're successful in furloughing a, a number of, of staff? And um, we, the director, the difference between the, the two figures was, was what we um, determined to be the, the shortfall. Um, so the in terms of the, the due diligence process that, that we went through, um, there are certain of the, the costs that we were able to have a degree of, of certainty with, and I'm not suggesting for a minute any of this is perfect, but where, where we were able to, con to, to compare a cost that was being um, notified to us as part of this process with last year's equivalent, and as the, the chairman said, that's um, that's available in their um, their accounts. Then we did that. Uh, the, the costs for um, the uh, extra COVID-related spend um, really was a, a process of judging whether that was reasonable, and um, at the end of the day, um, asking for a, a personal sign off from each council's accounting officer. Um, and I'm not saying for a minute that I, would, I don't trust any of the, the accounting officers, but they will bear in mind that they'll be subject to the local government audit process mm -hmm. um, in, in, in due course. Um, so those would be our main safeguards. I'll maybe just ask Anthony if he wants to add anything to that in terms of the detail of the process. Yeah, the, 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 the issue particularly around lost income <clears throat> and from the initial, as Mark said, for, for, from the initial estimate, obviously by the time we got through to uh, working up a, a detailed submission, we were able to then, councils were able to refine more specifically uh, what their income loss had been, and they were able to provide us with the equivalent uh, <coughs> numbers from their accounts for uh, 2019. So we were able to match those up. Uh, um, uh, and uh, to be fair, I mean, uh, as Chair said, it was very open and frank, and, and some councils quite clearly said that we incurred this income last year, but we would never have gotten it this year. It was a one-off event, so they, they, that was, they discounted that themselves. Um, and it was a couple of iterations just for, so that we could be sure, uh, as best we can, that the, the, the numbers are matching up correctly. And similar other things, Couple of councils had, had forgotten or had in, in, in the haste that was needed uh, to include some elements of lost income. They were included back in again. Some others, as I say, had had uh, profiled over 12 months, and that was reduced down to, to the period that we're concerned with. Um, so really, that the income assurance and diligence was mostly based around the equivalency of the previous year plus any known changes that councils were able to tell us about. In terms of that, sorry. Yeah, no, uh, no, uh, sorry, go ahead, continue on, Anthony. I was just going to say, in terms of the additional cost, uh, um, that, that, that we know council spent a lot of cost in terms of uh, setting up and helping with, with the, the community response and, and the, the um, food banks and things, and, and councils were just able to provide us with detail of this is how much it has cost them, um, and, and that was signed off at finance officer and at chief executive level. So. I suppose probably because that process of due diligence is what potentially aggrieved councils will challenge the, the mm -hmm. rationale behind the decision. So I've just wanted to hear robustly as to the mechanisms involved. Um, can, can you confirm to me the COVID emergency, 
Was it declared on the 18th to the 19th of March in terms of uh, these revised income loss during COVID? Was that the period, the start of that, 18th to 19th of March? Uh, um, I'll have to come back to you. I'll be honest. It, it sounds right, but but I, I, I I'll have to. I mean, it was it was March, you know. So I, I, I would like an assurance uh, from accounting officers, etc., and from the department that um, there was no claim made before that period and uh, in, in calculating the the final outcomes for each council. So I, I would maybe you might right, have yeah. it on you at the moment, but I would like. Uh, uh, some clarity on it and we, we know that there's three support funds so there's the COVID emergency package the community support one where both have been paid out and I think there's another environmental support package yes. that, that we supplied and um, I take it that you can't have double payments in terms of what you claim for in, in the emergency package cannot be accounted for double payment in the same as the community support and the environmental package and can you give an insurance an assurance to us as the committee that, that there isn't a case of double payment uh, because obviously we know the the rate which is so finite. Yeah, well, well, certainly. I mean, if if the environmental package of is being handled by by uh, Dira and, and their waste management, and, and um, again, uh, members will know that that uh, finance minister identified three point eight million, um, and it can't. No, it's not. It, it isn't double counted. We're quite clear. We 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 liaise quite a lot with, with uh, Dira regularly on. Uh, their aspect of the claim and to that end <coughs> what we do as department because um, while we don't sponsor the uh, councils we have a lead responsibility so we actually include funding that's provided by, by other parties other government departments uh, because it's important that we see that in terms of council cash flow which was a potential issue so uh, uh, yes mean? sorry here we, are. we 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 came at there is no double funding in terms you, of, of this you, particular scheme. Are, are you aware of any double funding from the COVID emergency package and the community support package? So say, for example, <clears throat> something is PPE. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of uh, any double funding? I'm not aware of any any uh, double funding uh, on, on that aspect. The community support package that, that certainly that the department has funded uh, has gone via council, not not in support of council. It's been, so it's a sort of clear in and out, yeah. as far as I understand. Okay, and sure. Just finally, and I suppose it's probably a wider comment to use the committee chair and the committee. I know there has been a lot of, um, not not conflict, but there has there has been a lot of debate around the funding model provided to councils, and I suppose COVID has resharpened that debate and focused it in the eyes of many of our councillors across the country. With with the establishment of the partnership panel, I think it, it is something for maybe the the committee to consider. That, that we look towards a, a subgroup being set up with the minister and council leads to, to look at maybe a co-design and, and a funding model that's that's seen as sustainable and adequate going forward post-COVID, uh, as we've seen during COVID, the essential uh, function that our councils play in the support services across the country. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Um, Thanks, John. Thank you. Um, Kelly, I think, Kelly, you're going to come in next. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm just following on with what Johnny was just speaking about. Um, the reserves for councils, um, some of them would have dipped into the reserves and others haven't been able to dip into the reserves. Of the money that was allocated, um, I'm just wondering how much um, savings were required from councils, um, how much of their own money were they required to put into the, the package um, to meet the needs? Because obviously the first ask was over 40 million um, and then the final amount was 20.3 million, um, which was a huge amount. So I'm just wondering, is there is there anything there about what in the criteria was asked from councils for them to provide? Um, no, there... There, there wasn't the um, the the process. Really, was about understanding what the direct impact of COVID was. So that was um, for for our purposes three issues. Really, the um, the loss of income, the extra costs, and then the savings that they were able to um, to make through the furlough scheme. So we weren't making any judgment or any we, we didn't make part of the process any assessment of um, whether councils would use reserves or um, 
I don't know what you would call it, maybe a ability to pay or 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 anything like that. It was it was very much constrained by uh, what the the real impact of of COVID was. Thank you very much. Um, I think I would join with, with Johnny to say that a future funding model would be something I would be keen to see. Um, having come from the community and voluntary sector, it's spelled out very clearly that unless you have um, a working reserve, um, you cannot continue on as a viable organisation. And I would like to see that with councils. If, heaven forbid, there should be another crisis like this, they do need to certainly hold monies for emergencies, but not to retain those monies when you know, and hold them back when the emergency happens. Um, just have a couple of questions here, if you bear with me. I'm aware that some councils um, have been purchasing additional food in order to meet the needs in their local community because the amount that was provided through the department um, w has had to be added to. I'm just wondering, those councils that have incurred additional costs above what they have already um, been allocated, will they be permitted to invoice um, the department for that, or will that be taken into consideration in the next con the next three months of um, work that you guys are doing? Uh, I'd maybe ask Anthony to answer that yeah. in terms of the next few months. Um, I suppose the the over um, the overarching answer to that is we, we have a, a food program in place and a rationale for um, for rolling that out, uh, and it is limited. So. The, uh, again, it's one of those ones where if if we had unlimited um, resource to um, to make it available to, to councils to support vulnerable people, we'd love to do that. Uh, but uh, it's it, it's not unlimited. So, um, Anthony, just do, do you want to comment on that further point? No, uh, thank you, Mark. I, I think you're quite right. The 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 issue of um, where councils have incurred cost over and above. What was um, set out in, in the food program? Um, I, I honestly couldn't sit and say here now. Yeah, they can invoice for us for it. Uh, I think we we will have to follow it up with with the food program as to why additional uh, food packages were needed. But that being said, we're we're in the process of asking councils again to identify for the second quarter the additional costs that they incurred. So um, I, I am sure councils. Where it has a, where that has uh, arisen, we'll put it in as their bid. It's like everything else; uh, it'll be subject to to uh, available resources and, and, and due diligence. Thank you. Um, I'm just very aware that some councils um, are have pulled out the stops and have worked so hard to um, provide support within their communities, but. As you have alluded to, um, hopefully this pandemic and the issues will come to an end. And I think yeah. we need to educate both councils and the public that this type of support won't continue on forever, um, that we do need to return to some semblance of normal and that those food boxes, while they have been fantastic, can't continue on. I'm very yeah. aware as well that the, the level of support that was provided to each council is different. Um, that could be for a number of different reasons. The number of beneficiaries that you know they have helped, um, some of their other money that they may have had available. But I'm very aware that um, some areas have more charitable organisations that have been able to step in and help out. Um, some of those charitable organisations have actually been under a huge amount of pressure. And when they haven't been able to help, people have been going and then putting pressure on councils. I'm just wondering, is there any... Um, is the department considering with councils any consideration of how the community is being measured, what the outcomes are, how many people have been helped, how much has been given to people, um, and what the ongoing impact of this um, pandemic will be, so that we know how to gradually come away from the heavy amount of support that we're providing at the moment? Uh, I suppose the, the honest answer to that is I, I don't know. Um, that's... Uh simply just because it's not within my area of the department, but it's something I could I could take away and um, we, we could speak to our colleagues uh, on the engaged communities side of the department and and um, respond to the, to the committee. I think it would be helpful, just this my final point, um, just that um, given that we're in an outcome-based um, process now, um, so much good work has been done, and I would like to see the sort of measurement of that to see what it has done for people in the community. It's very good when we see the figures. It looks, you know, my goodness, Belfast and and Armagh and Bridge Craig Avon have done very well, but actually, 
all the areas have done very well. They have helped an extraordinary amount of families and, and vulnerable people out there, and it would be good to be able to quantify that in some way. Thank you. Okay, okay I don't have any other members who have put their hands up on the um, Starleaf to speak, and don't forget that you are all muted as well. So if you, any of you do want to speak, you need to touch that hand. Oh, there we go. Mark Durkin has put his hand up on. So if we can go to Mark. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thanks to Anthony and Mark for the presentation. Uh, Johnny and Kelly covered most of the questions that I was uh, going to raise. They were all process-based. So just sort of to, to sum up, I suppose, or, or, or to bring all them together, I, I'd ask Mark and Anthony, are they content that this process was as robust as it could have been? And will the next bid, the, the second bid coming from the councils, will it be subject to the exact same process? Or will you change that process in any way? Um, I, I'd have to say I am content that it was a robust process. Um, as as was said at the, the start, it was done collaboratively with councils. So um, we would naturally take on board any feedback that was that was offered. So if if um, if a weakness in that process was being pointed out to us, we'd certainly look at that. Um, but I, I, I do think the, the 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 process in the round has produced the uh, a fair results. I think uh, one of the members said it, it would have been, uh, it's always better if we can um, make more money available because of the work that has been done. But um, given the, um, the, the number of bids that DOF has had on the table at the time and still has. Um, I think this was a reasonable way of um, ensuring that the, uh, the the vast majority of the direct impact on councils of COVID was taken care of. I, I don't know whether that will be possible as we go forward. That's that'll depend on decisions made by the by the executive. But um, I'm not aware of any fundamental issue that anybody has raised with the, the way that we, we did the calculation. If they did, we'd certainly look at it. Yeah, uh, it, it's just on the face of it, just looking at it and not being privy to, obviously, the detailed estimates that uh, you received. We, while we would all want a bigger pie, absolutely, uh, it's your job to work, work out how many slices are needed and what size those slices would be. But just looking at it, some some of the bigger people got smaller slices. <laughs> some of the biggest people got some of the smallest uh, slices. And uh, it, it's sometimes hard to think how the, the smaller people would be hungrier than they are. Yeah, I, I think just the... And, and obviously there's 11 councils and, and a bit of complexity behind that. But, you know, there... The lost income made up of, you know, what I was saying earlier, some tourism service income, some leisure service income, fees generated, that is quite different across the piece. So, um, you know, given the, the time of the year, for example, you could you could probably see that a couple of councils that have quite a heavy reliance on income from tourism projects would have a bigger loss for the first quarter. Uh, you know that's and that fed into the, the sort of calculation that that we had to do. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, I've got Fra waiting to speak. Fra McCann. Hello. Hi, Can you Fra. Hear me, sir? Yes, go ahead, Fra. Can you? Hear me? Yes. The, uh, th thank you very much. Sorry, I, the, I was having difficulty with the the, the system there, but it's probably my lack of understanding and te technology more than anything else, Mark and Anthony. You're, uh, thank you for the presentation. I think we're in all very difficult times. And uh, as in the past, I would like to commend the department and the minister uh, and the general community and councils uh, for the excellent work that they have done and uh, uh, the provision of leadership, uh, but also the provision of resources uh, that, that, that allows those most vulnerable in our society to, uh, to exist. Uh, in terms of parcels, I think uh, we're all on new ground. I think there, 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 there are many difficulties and we always need to work uh, towards making making uh, life, life better. Uh, and uh, I know that we might be uh, on our way out of this, uh, 
at 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 the, at the present times, and I think that uh, the, that that is always always followed uh, by uh, the the stark reality that it could visit us at any time in the near future, and uh, the, the, there there is a need uh, to ensure that uh, councils who like everything else is in the front line of getting these services on the ground and the community, and uh, funding and resources is essential to it. Uh, will, will will that be uh, an ongoing consideration uh, as we move ahead? And I take it that a strong partnership uh, exists between uh, councils and uh, the department and uh, the, the the broader community networks uh, to ensure that uh, that we refine and make uh, make it better in the delivery of these systems. Um. I maybe respond to that and and um, first of all, it's good to see you looking looking well, Fra. I'm not saying that just so you'll give me an easy time, but um, I, I, I should have said greetings from lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the thanks for the for the commendation of the department and the and the minister. Um, I think from the very outset of this, the minister said that she will be the advocate of the councils as they make their way through the. Uh, the crisis, but even more generally, I think she has said that that's her. She sees that as as her role as communities minister, and she's on record a number of times about the extent to which she values the voluntary and community sector. So I think probably that the way you've described it as a strong partnership between the department, <clears throat> local government, and the voluntary and community sector would would uh, would be very much the way that the minister would would see it, and the way that she'd want us to work. Um, as I was saying earlier, we would definitely be looking at the the bids from councils for the future period. And um, yet, yeah, we do all hope that we're through the worst of the of of COVID. I think everybody's concerned about a next a next wave, and there there will be ongoing costs. So I suppose all we can do is give the commitment that we'll try and determine those costs as as well as we can, and then make the best case for the additional resources through the Department of Finance, which, as I was saying, has uh, has probably bids on the on the table that would be a number of times uh, greater than the amount of money that's currently available to them. No, thank you very much. I think, well, I think one, one uh, uh, just another two points or questions uh, to, to, to raise. And uh, it's just it's, it's not a matter for many councils of just turning the tap on and everything gets back to normal. I think uh, the, the the difficulties that they face financially uh, will be with us for a while, uh, and, and and they will need as much help and assistance uh, to, to to see their way through it. Uh, you give a list in your your presentation uh, of the the, uh, the the issues that they normally deal with that have been seriously uh, impacted upon, and uh, could uh, the, the the I take it that. Uh, and that partnership that the, the the department will be looking at novel ways uh, that to, to work with councils that finance can be provided uh, to ensure that they 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 remain with their heads above water and and and, and move moving forward. And I know that uh, quite often a lot of this falls down to the rate. And uh, I would be concerned that uh, at the end of this, and you you all are, you already hear it mentioned. That the, the temptation there uh, for for some councils are, is uh, to seriously hike up the rate at a time when people are feel, feel, feeling it really difficult. Okay, um, yeah, it is going to be difficult. There's there's no um, no no question about that. Um, I think the the rate base um, that's. There's likely to be an impact on that. That's just, I think, everybody's prediction that the the impact of COVID on the economy is going to be severe, and uh, there's been all sorts of estimates of what that would look like. Um, the the councils have have been engaging with the Department of Finance through the Land and Property Services, uh, just to try and understand what the extent of that could be. So, um, I'm, I, I was at a meeting with. Solus and LPS, uh, where that was discussed in some detail around, you know, if if the if the business um, rates base was to be impacted by X percent, what would that 
um, translate into in terms of council funding. So that that conversation is is ongoing now. We're we're not directly involved in that, but we are um, aware of it and 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 trying to keep ourselves um, abreast of that. The I think your your proposal that we look at more innovative and novel ways for councils to generate funding. Think, absolutely, yeah, it's been degree of a degree of flexibility. Some councils <laughs> will have. Uh, the the wherewithal the, at the end the the the, the, the see that, that that's through, and uh, some of the stuff that is coming through, you know that uh, you know, at the end of this you may need a, some type of economic stimulus uh, that will allow councils uh, to move forward. Some people have mentioned the possibility of uh, the, something from the regional rate uh, that would allow them to move forward with this, and is that one of the things that may be considered? Uh, uh, moving forward to, to, to help and assist councils? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I think that's probably one for the executive to, to make a call on because the regional rate obviously supports the um, central government as well as local government and sure. both sides are under pretty severe pressure at, at, at this point. Uh, but I, but I, I would... I would expect that all of those things would have to be on the table for uh, for ministers to to look at. Sure, just what just one last point. I noticed in the the, the paper that was provided, which actually surprised me, is that uh, councils can't declare bankruptcy. I know there's been speculation even in the in the, the recent months uh, <coughs> that uh, that uh, there may be one or a councillor or more that may look down that road, uh, but. The uh, and, and and when you go into some of the the uh, the, the other elements of, of that that's in the document, it's quite frightening uh, when 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 you look at it. And uh, are the, uh, the 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 is the department working with councils to ensure that uh, that uh, all aspects of their fi finances is, is not only known, but that the, the department will come in and give whatever advice and help and assistance that they the councils will need uh, to ensure that they come at the orient of this. Um, well, yeah, we would we, certainly commit to providing whatever advice uh, we can. The assistance bit of it will depend on the resource that's available to us. Um, I think the, the councils can't, can't be bankrupt. Um, yeah, that, I think that's, that's just a, a kind of a, a technicality. You know, any organization can run out of money. I think that the point that was being made there was it, it, that councils individually have the responsibility to balance their books. And if that means that they have to take drastic action, whether that's on reducing their costs or increasing their, their rates income, then it's for councils to, to do that. But I wouldn't want to suggest for a minute that, that, that that's somehow independent of central government. I think the, yeah. it's all about services to our community. And I, I think um, our, our minister would be, would be keen to see that we're doing everything we can to support the delivery of essential services. Okay, thank you very much, Mark, and it's good to see you again. You too, Fra. Thank you, Fra. Um, just following on, Mark, on, on Fra's point there, because it was something I was going to bring up at the end of the meeting as well, it was to do with the, the table that you provided us with, with the general powers of intervention, and it was rather stark and a, a little bit scary. And I suppose if we go back four or five weeks ago, um, th this is this is what we were being faced with, was possibly that this is what councils were facing. And, and as I say, following on from what Fra said, I, I mean, it, it gives us some degree of comfort to know that that relationship has been um, built up with those local councils and yourselves and the department. Um, so there will be no, there will be no shocks um, ahead of us, we will know in time um, if uh, if a council is is facing um, some very dire financial position. We will have that knowledge in time, and it will not be something that we'll see uh, across the headline of the news. Um, the department will know about it uh, long before that happens. So there is some degree of comfort, I suppose, for the committee we have there. Um, I don't have any other members who have their hands up. I know Robin is slightly different because he doesn't have that facility at the moment. Robin, was there anything you wanted to make comment on? Hello. Hello, Robin. Was there any comment you want to make? Or are you happy enough? No, it's just uh, I think all the questions have been answered. It's more of a request. Uh, can I be in the room when the uh, conversation takes place between Sammy Wilson, Mid and East Antrim Council, and the officials? 
think I might enjoy that one. Okay, thanks for that, Robin. Uh, okay, any other members then? That First. No other members want to make a comment? Nope, we're okay. Okay then, Mark Anthony, that was painless pretty much for yourselves there today. Um, so thank you. thank you for briefing thank us. You. And no doubt uh, we will hear from you in the not too distant future. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, members, we're going to move on then to our next agenda item, which is agenda item number six. Um, was there anything I was supposed to do at the end of that? No, it wasn't. Um, agenda item number six was a, de <coughs> it's a departmental briefing on the June monitoring round and reprioritisation. Members, you've been provided with the briefing paper at page 142 of your meeting packs. And can I welcome Gavin Patrick, Director of Financial Management, and Sheree Arnold, Director of Finance. Um, are you with us? Sheree and Gavin, just give us a moment. Hello, Hello yes. Oh, we've got you both. Hello. Good stuff. Thank you, you're both very welcome. Gavin, is it yourself then you're going to um, start with the briefing? I am indeed, yes. If I do an opening statement and then move to questions, that's okay. Good stuff, thank you. Uh, so, uh, I'll say good afternoon, Chair, and thank you for the opportunity for myself and my colleague Charlie to brief you today on both the Department's June monitoring and reprioritisation draft returns. Firstly, I would like to apologise for the paper only issuing on Monday. Given the circumstances we are in and the fact that these are two significant exercises being completed, a substantial piece of work has been undertaken to get to this stage. We will also be aware that the papers we have presented to the committee are draft and have not uh, been cleared by the Minister at this stage. The Department's uh, 2021 baseline totals 823.8 million resource and 214.1 capital. In addition, the Department has submitted COVID-19 bids totaling 164.3 million. Against these bids, the Department received an initial COVID allocation of 20.3. This included funding for the shielding package by clinically high risk of 10 million, discretionary support of 5 million, homelessness of 3.3 and the Community Support Fund of £2 million. The Executive agreed a further £45.8 million COVID allocation on the 18th of May. This includes funding for councils of £20.3 million, charities £15.5 million, and supporting people £10 million. At this early point in the year, it is anticipated that the full COVID allocation will be spent in full. As mentioned in our last briefing, Minister agreed that the indicative 2021 resource allocation and the COVID-19 allocations would be issued to business areas with the clear caveat that these were indicative and subject to change in line with Minister's priorities and the changing landscape due to COVID-19. This changing landscape is realised in part by DOF commissioning of a reprioritisation exercise on the 18th of May. The output of the department, department's reprioritisation exercise must be included in the uh, department's June monitoring return. And our draft returns were submitted to the DOF on Friday the 5th of June, clearly caveated that the Minister had not yet cleared the returns and they were still subject to committee scrutiny. Departments were to look to realign internal departmental budgets to meet the pressures they have identified for 2021. Departments were to assess what slippage has occurred as a result of COVID-19 and also what can be actively reduced or stopped in order to address the priority COVID-19 pressures identified. At a further stage, departments were determined the level of funding that can be surrendered to the executive for reallocation to COVID-19 pressures that cannot be managed as part of the internal process. In addition, departments were asked to identify capital slippage as well as projects that can be taken forward in 2021 with a particular focus on those which will help aid recovery and boost economic performance. Departmental officials undertook an extensive budget exercise in order to capture the most up-to-date position ahead of June monitoring. This work aligns with the DOF reprioritisation exercise. Considerable work has been ongoing on this, and by taking proactive management actions, all business areas are planning to live within existing non-COVID-19 budgets on the basis that ALBs can absorb the majority of their own pressures. In relation to COVID-19, 13.9 of largely inescapable costs have been identified to be met internally, and these are detailed in Table 2 of the briefing. The first stage of the reprioritisation exercise was for departments to realign internal budgets to meet the pressures they have identified. 
The Department's proposed first stage returns outlines 13.9 of proposed actions to be taken by the Department to reduce uh, the 2021 baseline spend, not as detailed in Table 4. These savings are a combination of reduced need, proactive actions such as not filling all vacancies as they arise in the Department, rather they are considered on a priority basis, and deferment of expenditure. It is proposed that these are used to address the 13.9 million of pressures highlighted in Table 2. Potential COVID-19 pressures totaling 24.7 million remain, and with the exception of supporting people PPE, these are not yet committed, and are outlined in Table 3, and bids are proposed to be put forward for these. That is for Northern Ireland Housing Executive homeowners, Homelessness of 3.7 million, Community Support Fund 4.5, Cultural Resilience Fund of 4 million, Sports Resilience Fund of 4 million, Benefit Delivery Resilience uh, Response for 5 million, and the Supporting people, PP of 3.5. In addition to these pressures, there are a number of other risks and uncertainties relating to the Department's overall 2021 resource position as we move into the recovery phase, which at this stage we don't have figures to bid on, but are flagging the DOF as potential pressures. These include that there's a potential for significant financial impact on DFC following the UK Government announcement that workers who have not taken all of their statutory annual leave entitlement due to COVID-19 will now be able to carry it over for two years. As the largest department, this will impact significantly on DFC. In 1920, DFC had a 6.6 .6 million accrual for annual leave carryover. So if the carried over leave were to double, as with the budget requirement. No additional funding has been included in 2021 for COVID-19 or economic downturn related benefit claim increases. Significant increases in benefit caseloads have been experienced as an initial and direct impact of COVID-19. In the short term, further increases have been mitigated in part through the coronavirus job retention scheme. However, the scale of future economic impacts from COVID-19, including the impact from the ending of the retention scheme, is unknown. In the medium to long term, these impacts will see further and likely significant increases in benefit caseloads and therefore increases in the number of staff required to deliver benefits. No additional funding has been included for developing new employment programs to assist individuals in returning to employment as part of COVID-19 recovery. The department is, however, holding two million of funding to assist with the development of the new employability NI program. This funding could be reprioritized to support COVID-19 recovery. The department is currently considering the potential requirements. However, at this early stage, no funding bids are proposed given the significant uncertainties related to the economic shock. This will be kept under a close review as the financial year progresses and the department may need to bid for further funding as a result of the economic position emerging. The culture, heritage, sports, arts and community voluntary sectors make a significant contribution to the local economy in promoting social inclusion and improving quality of life, health and well-being and in shaping Northern Ireland standing as a place to live, work and visit. The impact of COVID-19 has been acutely felt by these sectors. And the voluntary community sector play a critical role in delivering service to, services to those most likely to be differentially impacted by COVID-19. We are taking forward work to ascertain the extent of income losses, the recovery support being provided by other administrations, and to establish the quantum of support required in the context of the impact to date and any ongoing, any ongoing impact. The remaining area of uncertainty is in relation to councils, which my colleague Mark has provided detail on earlier in the meeting. Um, and the, the funding for 20.3 20 20 million, which was explicitly to support council financial pressures in the first quarter, is con considered adequate for that quarter. But as Mark has said, work is progressing between councils and the department in respect of the potential requirement for the period from the 1st of July to the 31st of October. And once this is known, it's likely the department will need to bid for further funding. Departments have been asked to provide a number of targeted options where expenditure can be stopped or reduced in lowest priority areas in order to fund higher priority areas across the wider executive. Given the 24.7 million of COVID-19 related pressures facing the, the department and the 13.9 of baseline savings already identified for reallocation internally to meet pressures, it is proposed that a no return is submitted in respect of this request. As mentioned in our last briefing, Minister agreed the initial 2021 departmental capital allocations, which have provided funding to business areas to meet their inescapable pressures and pre-commitments. It's been proposed that this budget is allocated in full to business areas, 
Within this allocation, the Department has included 9.6 million requirement for laptops to equip frontline benefit processing staff with IT to enable home working in light of COVID-19, but also to facilitate agile working going forward. Additionally, the Department's developing proposals for town centre recovery and an estimated capital requirement of 10 million. The Department's capital allocations reflect the latest requirements. However, there is a risk of potential, potential slippage in requirements as 2021 progresses. But at this stage, it's not recommended to submit any reduced requirements to BOF, and this can be considered further in October monitoring. In relation to baseline ring fence funding, at this point in the financial year, it is envisaged that the Department can take proactive management actions to live within its existing ring fence resource allocation. Given the uncertainties at this early stage in the financial year, this will continue to be closely monitored as the year progresses, and bids will be proposed in future monitoring rounds if appropriate. As part of the June monitoring exercise, um, it is proposed that a non-COVID-19 bid for 550000 for the Local Government Founders Commissioner is submitted. Commissioner is a statutory requirement set out in the Local Government Act to recommend any alteration to the number of boundaries and aims of any district's awards. The Act requires the Department to appoint a Commissioner within 8 to 12 years following the submission to the Department of the final report of the previous Commissioner. 2009-10 was the last time any spend was incurred by the then Department of, of the Environment. The appointment is for one year, and the resource bid of 550000 relates to the staffing costs and general administrative expenditure of the Commission. So to summarise, our draft return highlights a reprioritisation exercise actions to be implemented to release $13.9 million. But this $13.9 million is used to address the equivalent amount of COVID-19 related pressures. Bids of 24.7 million COVID-19 um, are to be submitted, uh, noting other significant risks and uncertainties not yet being bid for. And no return is provided for both stage two and capital elements of the reprioritization exercise. And one non-COVID-19 bid of 550,000 for the local boundary commissioner be put forward as part of June monitoring. At this point, Chair, Jerry and I are happy to take any questions on both our June monitoring and reprioritisation proposals. Uh, thank you, Gavin. Thank you for that, and thank you for your paper as well. Um, I just have a few questions. I suppose this June monitoring round is going to look like no other June monitoring round that we've um, ever uh, been through before. And I know that you have said that you, uh, the Department intends to submit a nil return. Um, in respect of surrendered funds. I don't know if you have this information or not, if it's av available to you as yet from your other colleagues in other departments. Um, I'd imagine um, that there will be very little money will be surrendered for June monitoring. I just suppose then to ask um, on top of that then, um, the bid of, of 24.7 million um, that has been put in by the department, if it's only partially um, uh, successful, what way will our revised requirements look, look then on Table 5, asking that firstly, and then also around the capital um, as well, uh, capital allocations. Has there been any more talk about multi-year capital funding? I know that whenever we sat in the programme for government groups, I know certainly I was in the same one as Kelly here in the room, and we, we were looking, we, hopefully we wanted to go on, that we wouldn't have one-year funding, that we'd have multi-year funding. Um, that would certainly help when it comes to some of the capital projects that are ahead. Just has there been any more talk about that, or do we anticipate that come uh, October monitoring round um, that some money then will have to be surrendered of, of capital projects? And then just finally, I just wanted to ask if you could just expand a wee bit more on the economic shock scheme. I know that it was in initially, and on the revised, it's no longer there. I know you did mention it there in your, your brief also. Um, just what exactly is the, the this 30 million, 30 million for economic shock scheme? Um, just what does that entail? If you just go into a bit of detail on that also. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, okay, so I'll try and answer those in order then. So in, in relation to other departments, um, I don't have any information on, on what their position are, but um, I would be in the same position as you probably, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect um, large easements from, from departments at this stage. Um, in relation to your question on if our bids aren't met, um, at, at this point, those, the only bid on Table 5 that is committed is in relation to supporting PPE, uh, 3.5 million. 
Um, the others aren't yet committed, but obviously uh, are um, seen as, as uh, extremely high priority for the department. So we, we would then therefore need to look and see how we can um, uh, support those in another way if the bids aren't met. Um, regarding multi-year capital, um, again, it wouldn't, as part of the new decade and year approach, it was both capital and resource um, were being looked at for multi-years. Um, um, but given the, the issues over the past number of months, uh, nothing further has been taken forward that in regards to that, as far as I'm aware. Um, and we haven't had any discussion yet with DWF around um, any future years, whether it be one or a multi-year. Um, and then the economic shock. Those, uh, the, sorry, just then it was the economic shock scheme. Just what what it, what was that yeah. the entail? Okay, uh, good I, I was just going to pass over to Charlie for that. Okay, sorry. Okay. okay, go ahead. Good afternoon, Chair. Hi, Chair. The 30 million econo the economic shock discretionary support bid was a very early bid from the department, um, right at the end of March. It was proposed at that time that it would provide support for those losing employment due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It was, however, withdrawn at a very early stage. Um, uh, as it wasn't something that could have been delivered in the first quarter. This would have been due to the need to have legislation in place and also to, to enable the payments. Um, and again, this wouldn't have been feasible within the time period. Um, also, too, the risks to those losing um, employment have been in part mitigated with uh, the coronavirus job retention scheme and also, too, options that are available to those now self-employed, uh, um, such as universal credit and, again, to their ability to access benefits. We have, however, flagged to the Department of Finance as part of the monitoring round. Obviously, there will be the needs going forward with potential for further increases in benefit caseloads um, as the coronavirus job retention scheme ends or, and or um, employers have to start to contribute. But also to the need for, um, again, um, employment programmes to support those who have lost their jobs, obviously, return to employment. Okay, thank you for clearing that. that I mean, that sounds like a very good scheme. Um, and it's a shame that it wasn't progressed, and I know the reasons why. Absolutely understand the reasons why. Um, but it hasn't. It, it still is there in the background. To take it, sure, it'll still be rumbling on. Should we need to to pull that scheme out and use it? At the minute, at the minute, as part of the monitoring round, we've actually removed that thirty um, million requirement, as you'll see in, on table five. Yeah. Um, again, if there was further funding came to the Northern Ireland block, it's obviously something again that the department would consider. But we have tried to balance at this point in time um, what the department bids for um, against the money that's likely to be available. Okay, no, that's grand. Thank you for clearing that up. And just another, just one more final question, and it's to do with the 10 million COVID-19 Town Centre Resilience Fund. Um, and I know from Table 5 as well, the, bus the business um, districts had been pulled on that funding for that. Um, is the, this ten million for the the, the COVID nineteen uh, town centre resilient fund? Is it going to be linked at all to the business improvement districts, or is this something very different? Um, well, business improvement districts normally be resource funding, um, and this is capital. Um, but our uh, colleagues are working closely with the the councils, um, just to to try and determine what their needs would be in relation to capital to allow such a scheme to be taken forward. Okay, and what, what's the rationale for for that scheme then for town centre resilience? What's the rationale behind that? Um, because we know um, at the moment many of our town centres shops will be opening tomorrow, so they will, and will have had to have gone out and spent their own money to put in various um, PPE, whether that's uh, perspex screens, all of the rest of the stuff that those businesses have had to go and provide. Albeit, I do know that some councils are providing help with that at the moment. Um, so, what what do you see as the, this town centre resilience fund actually doing for our, for our town centres? Uh, well, it is at an early stage, um, so it's, it's more likely to need to be for the medium term and later in, in the year, as opposed to something that is going to immediately help tomorrow when shops start to reopen. Um, and again, the, the engagement has just begun between the department and, and councils in the past uh, couple of weeks. 
Okay, so uh, oh, all right. So councils are, will then come back to to the department then um, with some ideas they may have uh, in relation to how this money should be spent. Yeah, the, the, the engagement has already started on that. Um, you know, like I said, one of my colleagues is, is leading on that, and um, uh, just to try and determine what the, the best way it could be focused and prioritised to, to support the, the town centres. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. I'm going to open up now, and Kelly is first to signify she wants to speak. Kelly Armstrong. Yep. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I just uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I don't envy you. Um, it has been probably one of the most difficult times to ever be someone involved in finance. I imagine no sooner than you had your paper written that it changed again. Um, but I just wanted to ask you, on that table five, um, the, the £24.7 million, um, a lot of us around the committee will be relieved to see um, potential future money there for sport. Um, and for the, the cultural division, um, the resilience funding. That's additional to what has already gone out. Could I just check with you, um, when, if, if that money is secured, that £24.7 million, is there enough time left this year for organisations to access that funding um, and to make use of it? Um, and the second question just on that part is, um, will there be criteria um, set out against that scheme. Uh, we know that the initial resilience funding or the, the hardship fund, apologies, the hardship fund that was issued by Sport NI and the Arts Council, um, especially the Sports Council, was based on a, on a picked amount and it was those organisations that got in um, to make a bid um, within the days that it was open, uh, it was there. But is there an intention that the department will create a criteria for those funds? Um, I know, again, my colleagues in the sports and arts have been working closely with the, the arm strength bodies on this. Um, I don't have the detail of um, how it, uh, the scheme would run or the, the criteria, so um, I'm happy to, to come back to you on those. Um, that would be if really you're content with that, I, I, I don't have the detail in front of me on that, and I, I would say that they're probably still being developed at this stage, it but we can come back to you on that. It would be appreciated. Thank you very much, Chair. Maybe if we could ask for the criteria in that, because I know that the last time, while we were very grateful that the department was able to get money out quickly for sports, um, not everybody was quick enough on the on the forms to get that in. Um, I just have two more questions, and it's linked to what the Chair was talking about. Um, the twenty four point seven million pounds in, in, in Table 5, if there is no more money on the table, if no other department can relinquish any funds um, to make that available, um, what's the alternatives? And then secondly, going back to that town centre resilience, um, I'm just wondering, has there been any cross-departmental discussions with the Department for Infrastructure? An awful lot of the town centres have been looking for widening of footpaths um, and considerations to be made to protect people before they get into those shops that are opening tomorrow. And I'm just wondering if there's any joined up thinking um, on that, because DFI are looking at... at their expenditure on that and, and they're working with councils and I'm just wondering if you guys or somebody within the department is also joining that discussion. Um, so in relation to your first question, um, I suppose I've tried, tried to answer to the chair if, if bids aren't met, um, only one of those areas is already committed and that's in relation to the PPE uh, and the others aren't yet committed. However, they are clearly seen as high priority, and therefore we will, we will need to um, uh, do another look across our, our budgets to see what can be done, if there can be any more reprioritisation. Having said that, we've, we've obviously just gone through that exercise um, to try and achieve that already. Um, we certainly don't have a, a pot of fun, funding held in the department to be able to, to um, put funding against those as it stands. Uh, in relation to the Town Centre Resilience Fund, as I say, the, the engagement has just started. I, I, know, I know for definite the engagement is there with the councils. I, I don't know if it's with DFI, but I would have thought it would be. Um, but um, I will take that back to my colleague and, and, and highlight, highlight, to him, highlight that to him to, to ensure that they're included, if they're not already. That would be very useful. Um, I know that some town centres are anticipating um, 
obviously business and a lot of people appearing in the town centres tomorrow. Um, I know that DFI have been asked, for instance, about the traffic warden system. Councils are considering their paid car parks, so there's, there's opportunities for income to be generated there, although we need people to go back and to spend money as safely as well. But it would be it would be worthwhile not to have to spend all the money through the department and for DFI maybe to come on board and so there's no duplication and there's actually you know, sharing out of any of those types of costs, yeah. especially for footpath widening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I suppose it's worth noting as well that uh, the councils cannot be charging for car parking because that was part of their claim up until the end of June. So that's maybe worth noting for anybody that's going shopping. Um, they would have claimed that as their lost income up until the end of June. And yeah. um, so they can only start charging from the 1st of July. Um, I have no members who... Oh, I do. Sorry, I have one. A Fra. Fra. Fra McCann. I notice that you always read the small print in, uh, in, in terms of uh, all that we fill in. And uh, that's always good. But it's just... Uh, and most of the most of the questions have been asked, but I just and certainly in the, the town and city centre uh, resilience, I think that uh, the, the that towns and cities will need tremendous help uh, to see see if us encourage people back into city centres again. Uh, obviously, with, with as far as people are frightened, and I think, but I would like to raise the case of uh, the, the 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 I'm the vice chair of the committee for the visually impaired. And uh, blame people and people uh, that are partially said it are having a tremendous difficulties uh, in terms of uh, in terms of being unable to read the signage, uh, getting in the shops, being able to see the 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 the, the signage on the ground that uh, tells you to socially distance, and uh, it's been difficult uh, for them uh, when they when they don't know and they're moving close to people uh, that they some of them have been verbally abused, uh, and I think so. I think that uh, when people are looking at uh, the, the since shops are opening, uh, they should take into consideration that there's a whole section of our population uh, that find that find it very difficult. Uh, dogs for uh, for blind people, uh, uh, no social distance. Uh, so we, uh, whilst we we all uh, f uh, find difficulties, there are people there who are far worse off, and I would just uh, raise that with the department to take that into consideration. An account when they're saying, and that goes for all departments. Chair, can I just come back just on the town resilience to so just check with my colleague? So, um, he has he has met with DFI and the Department for the Economy and Tourism, and I were also there, and he's due to meet with DERA. Um, and there's no overlap in their interventions, but um, looking at opportunities to work together. Okay, Fra. Okay, I just wanted to, to, to demand that, but as at the times, uh, uh, issues like this and uh, uh, fall off the, 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 the table. I know, and thank you for raising that. There's, there's so much that a lot of us able-bodied people take for granted, and um, yeah. and I think it's good that you've raised that point. Um, anything else? There, there's no other member has indicated that by their putting their hand up that they want to speak at this stage. I'll give them another couple of seconds if they want to. Nope. Absolutely none. So there you go. Oh, hold on. Robin, did you want to say something? No, I'm content, Chair. Sure. That's grand. That's okay. Thank you. So that's it. Um, Gavin and uh, Jerry, you got off uh, rather lightly there as well today, so you did. So uh, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. <laughs> thank you for your brief. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks. Bye bye. Okay, um, members, we then need to um, decide what we do now with this information. So if members are content, um, could we then write to the department indicating that the committee is content with the proposed bids and the reprioritisation? -prior Please don't make me say that again. <laughs> um, are members content with that? Certainly members in the room, I can see you both, so you're both content with that. Yeah. And then I'll just ask members, um, I can't ask members on the phone if they're content. If members aren't content, rather, will they, they put their hand up? Nope, everybody seems content with that. And also, can I seek agreement um, for the departmental papers to be forwarded to the committee for finance also? Okay, and if any members aren't content with that, let me know. Nope, nobody's coming back, so we're all fine with that as well. Okay, members. Just bear with us. Be patient. We're going to move on now to matters arising. Sure. So, can I just very quickly, just off the back of Fra's point, can yes, I certainly. ask that, obviously, I, I do have a visual impairment, 
I'm actually registered blind. And it's a very, very valid point that Fra raised at times. You know, I have difficulty being able to see things. So just maybe even if we can just write to the department just to further emphasise that, that point and just see what the department are doing or any considerations that are being taken. Absolutely, Andy. Yep, we will do that all in agreement. I'm sure nobody would disagree with that. Sure. Yep. Sorry, Fra, sorry. Did you want to comment? Go ahead. Go ahead, Fra. Uh, just on uh, the back, that's a, that's, a, that's a good suggestion by Andy, and that, that letter could go to all departments. Yeah. And I think was it's not just a, a, a department for communities uh, the, where the difficulty lies, but or, or their decision uh, singularly. I think that all departments need to take into consideration that uh, that, uh, that there are difficulties out there. Okay, that's agreed then. We'll write to all departments then, um, highlighting those issues. Can I just let all of the members on Starleaf know now that they're now, we can now hear everybody? It's uh, from what I can gather. We're, we're, you're all in the room now, so just watch what, no. don't, be, don't be having a conversation with your other half or anyone else or we will hear it. So you're all back on spotlight. So we're going to start then with matters arising. Um, so. Members will now consider um, departmental replies to committee queries. Can I just first of all say that I'm somewhat disappointed. Some of these letters date back as far as the, the beginning and middle of February. And there, there is supposed to be a, a, a protocol for 10 working days for replies. So I do understand we've had COVID in the middle of that and that has caused a bit of an issue and there's been an influx on the minister's table with various things that she has done and done very well. But I just want to put it on record, some of these are way before that. Um, but we have got a lot of replies through. So if members can just bear with us um, as we go through this. And maybe just if members in agreement, if we can just if I can just write again to the minister, just a reminder of the, the ten day uh, ten working day rule when it comes to replies, albeit we do understand that there have been Many other things have been happening um, over the last couple of months. Um, so, if members are okay with that, um, I'll then move on. Then, so members, the relevant papers start at page thirteen of your meeting packs. I am not going to address each one individually because there are just so many. But before I go and ask members if they have anything they want to highlight, if I could just uh, refer you to page 121 of your meeting pack. This is a copy of the 12th report from the Examiner of Statutory Rules. And the Examiner draws the committee's attention to three rules that breach the 21-day rule. The Examiner is content with the Department's response that the breach has occurred in the context of the department's urgent responses to the COVID-19 um, crisis, so it's just to draw that to your attention. So I'm going to then I'm going to go to the room first. I'm going to ask our two members in the room: Was there anything um, under matters arising of all those departmental responses that they want to bring up first? Members in the room, anything at the moment? Nope, we're fine. Maybe come back. Oh, sorry, Kelly. Sorry, right, just to say that. Um, as the, it's been quite a while, but the second review of PIP um, that I have been talking to Marie Kavanagh on a on a different basis, um, just to have faith, you know to discuss with her generally about the consultation response, not on behalf of the the committee, um, just because I'm somebody who works with disability on a regular basis. Um, very interesting um, report. Hopefully, it'll be coming out of that, and it'd be good to see that coming to the committee. Okay. All right. I'll take note of that. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to now go to members on the phone. We have some hands up already of people who have notified us. So, um, first of all, I have Johnny, Johnny Buckley. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Charles, I know there's quite, a, there's quite a list of them, but I suppose probably in relation to the correspondence on the foods, uh, I'm just have, sorry, I'm switching between screens here. Uh, the, the request for clarification following DSA's scheme in relation to the food parcel service. Um, I don't know if other members have experienced uh, difficulties or concerns about this scheme. It has been brought to my attention by, by quite a few in terms of how this scheme was actually administered, in terms of how it was targeted, um, those that were able to receive and others, and others that weren't. And I don't think there was a uniformity of that policy across Northern Ireland in terms of, I know it was probably easier in some councils to access uh, the, the food parcel service than others. I would just, I would, I would like... Um, Maybe a, a, an audit, or a few, well, not, not even an audit, but a, a review of the um, of this service and, and how it was administered. In terms of, uh, is there anything that we can learn from it uh, going forward? Because if we we do find ourselves in positions like this again, yes, it it, it was brilliant that there was an, um, 
an avenue in which com the community could support those most vulnerable. But I would have some concerns as to how it was administered uh, and it was there uniformity across the board. So it's just concerns that I have, and, and I would probably like further clarity in terms of information regarding the scheme and its delivery, and maybe uh, hearing from the department on how they felt that that was administered. No, I, I understand that. I know I had um, several issues with it in my own area, but it wasn't necessarily the Department for Community's fault yeah. um, so because so too. much of the shielding letters, some people were only yeah. receiving their shielding letters three three weeks ago. Um, so yeah. that's a, an issue for the Department of Health and, and our GPs that were sending those out. So it wasn't very joined up, um, I know that much, albeit it, it did um, bring relief to many many people out there and there's no getting away from that and um, it would uh, and i suppose you know it's like anything um there there will be time after all of this is over to look at how we did things and some things were done very well others were done as best they could at that time um so yeah that's that's um, for for future but i think i, I, I agree on, with on your, you on your on your point there um i suppose my main concern with can be with it what that very often these types of schemes um benefit most those that are already in organized community groups and i suppose probably that's the only real avenue in which you can target a, a specific community but for something like covid which probably adversely affected those that were not involved in, in any particular community groups or having that access to to information like a lot of community groups do through their leaders etc i think particularly probably in my own constituency in a lot of rural communities um, where that there is that lack of service in some areas because they, they don't interact or, or don't integrate into the already established community system that's here in Northern Ireland. We do have quite a good community-based system, but there is a lot of people that can fall through the cracks, and that was my concern as to how you know, we administer a scheme like this to ensure that you know, we get to the most in need and that it doesn't become a... a, a food delivery service for, for community groups, albeit that's a vital service, but a lot of these community groups are supported by other means. Okay. Kelly, did you want to come in on that point? I was actually going to say that, that this is a case of um, the Department of Health had a, a system that Department of Communities end up paying for. And I agree absolutely with what Jonathan has said. Um, we had a system where I knew in my area there were people receiving three food parcels in the one week um, from different sources. It would be good because it is government money and these are vulnerable people to make sure that the right people have got it. There was no means testing on this. It was just simply if you have a health condition, you'll get access to these. But it was different across the countryside. And as Jonathan has said, my concern now is that I'm hearing from councillors and councils that they want to continue on this scheme which is actually going to duplicate and take away from some of those absolutely amazing food banks. I, I was going to suggest if it would be possible to write to the Department of Health just as the committee to say that we recognise that this was a, a fantastic system that was set up to react quickly to COVID, but in moving forward, could they work with the, the two departments together to manage this a lot better so it's fairer and um, more inclusive of those who are most vulnerable? Okay. All right. Sure. Can I yes, certainly. Go ahead, Carl. So, um, first of all, the issue that you identified with the shielding letters is the one at, at the centre of the problem. Um, even people who, and it was a lot of this was on trust, a lot of it was on face value. Um, people who were genuinely, you know, with small children who couldn't get out. Um, I have to say, in North Belfast, I haven't came across any cases where the same family got three packets or boxes, and um, it was done fairly well. Um, and if anything, you know, it actually brought groups together. Uh, they actually helped. There was a focus and a concentration to try and get the support out to people who needed it most. So I thought that was good. The issue I have is with health. Um, because as you say, like I know a constituents when you got their letters there um, in the second week of, of May um, and the week after that. So that was literally three, four weeks ago. Um, and you just had to trust them. So I do think we do, I mean, I would be content to write the Department of Health, but I, 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 would, I would really request that we just ask what the delay was because let's, let's hope that we don't go through a second phase of this 
Um, and as we've heard earlier on, resources are really stretched, but we still need to try and help those who need it most. Um, and even just in terms of rural communities, you know, was a rural network involved? Was the farmers unions involved or any other agencies involved? And then the, the other aspect for me is, and I've raised this before, um, I, like I was disappointed with some of the groups who were receiving support and people funds because when we were out delivering packages, some of the housing associations who have floating support workers through support and people um, had to shield themselves. And, you know, like I, 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 it took me an awful long time to try and find out what, what alternative arrangements they were making. Um, but for me, I would really ask that we just write to health, just to ask them and, um, and also write to the BMA in terms of GPs because one, one set is blaming the other. And I just think we need to try and get to the bottom of it. We're not blaming anyone. We're just asking them what the delay was because we need to learn lessons for the future. Thank you, Chair. Oh, that's fair enough, Carol. Carol, just while you're on the line, if you can still hear me, is there anything else? Is there anything else, Carol, under um, any of those matters arising that you wanted to bring up? Are um, you all Chair, right with them? Just, sorry, it was in relation to. I think it's just. Um, and I mean, there was. We already asked about the dormant accounts fund for community groups. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the the departmental response into the Savills report is there. I think it's probably something after summer recess or some of these issues that we need to come back on because particularly in relation to housing, um, the bill for repairs is huge. Um, it's going to come down to the ministers and the department's yeah. approach to the housing executive um, and indeed housing associations. Um, and we need to get through the re we need to get through the housing amendment bill to see if it comes out the other end of that. So it's really just the earmark um those for the future i would also share your concerns in terms of why we all appreciate the impact of covid and it was huge and i have to say i'm not saying it because dirty's my colleague but i thought the department for communities really really stepped up but for us what we do need if there's questions being asked we, we need to get a timely response and if that response can't be given some acknowledgement of why i think would be appropriate um, and and that's that's the only issues that I would have chair at this stage. And the second um, quarter of the money for councils is worked up on as we speak. So I guess we just keep an eye on that and see what happens coming out of that. Okay, thank you, Carol. Um, I think Fra, your hand is up on my my screen at the side here. Did you want to make a comment on the matters arising? Are you okay? No, I'm, I'm okay with that, chair. Dead on. That's okay. okay. Um, Johnny's already come in. Is so no other members want to make comment on any of the matters arising. Okay, we'll move on then. Yep, that all right? Um, okay, let me just bear with me, please. We're going to move on then to agenda item number seven, which is correspondence. Uh, members, you'll find the correspondence memo at page one eight one <coughs> of your meeting pack. Um. Members, we have received requests from a number of organisations to brief the committee. You'll see these at items 7.4, 7.5 and 7.6 on page 181. Um, so I just want to ask our members um, how they wish to proceed to these requests. Um, members, you'll see that if you go to... Page um, What, there's a... a from the Arts Collaboration Network, the Ulster Orchestra, and um, Pivotal. Um, so there's there's three I have written to us to ask for to come and brief the committee. It's just what you what you feel on that. I know the first one certainly, the Arts Collaboration Network represents um, many groups. Um, so uh, I just I'd be led by you. It's not up to me to decide who comes and briefs the committee. It's up to the committee to decide. So if members have any comment they wish to make on that or if they want to take a further look at that and come back to um, Kevin uh, sort of tomorrow or Monday, um, if they want sure. to take a further look at that. Um, sure, Carol, can, can, I, can I just ask her, oh, sorry, the Robin. three that are asking, were they standing outside of the uh, briefing that we had last week? Um, certainly the two, the briefing from the Arts Council. 
Yes. But I know the Arts Council certainly um, mentioned the Ulster Orchestra in their briefing. They, they, they did mention that. And I know from the letter, if you read it, the, and I know from the Ulster Orchestra, have done some very innovative and wonderful things during lockdown to still entertain uh, and still provide a service. So that and I acknowledge that. Um, I don't know about the Arts Collaboration Network. Uh, what do you think, Kevin, with they? I, I think, Chair... The, the is, it, is it possible, Chair, to have, the, if we agreed with, by you, Chair, to have the three, is it possible to have the three coming on the one briefing? No, it's not, I'm because they're not, all, they're, they're, they're not all linked together, so they're not, so that's why they're I'm not. saying to you, okay. look, members, I okay, would prefer sure. if you would go and have a wee read through them, and then if yeah. you could come back to Kevin either tomorrow or Monday, yeah. and then we'll make a okay. definite decision then, and then we sure. can bring that, we can do the decision at committee next week. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Sure. Okay, members, any other correspondence? Sorry, Carol? Sorry, Chair. Um, we, uh, did you monitor around there's, there was a proposal perhaps for additional funding um, so I, I certainly will read this go through again and then wait to see what the outcome of that is from the finance when it gets led in the assembly and then be happy to take briefings after that but I have to say I just want to put this on the record the information that we got uh, from some of those groups was a lot more detailed than what we got from the Arts Council itself okay yeah Thank you for that, Carol. Yeah, that's noted. So it is. Any members want to bring anything else up under correspondence? Nope. Are members then content with the correspondence memo yeah. as drafted? Great. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm going to move then on to agenda item number eight, which is our forward, forward work programme. Um, members, next week on the 17th of June, the committee is scheduled for briefings by the department on an LCM on immigration and social security and on COVID-19 funding to supporting people. Um, the department also intends to introduce a pensions bill before the summer, summer. so we need to take um, a pre-introductory briefing next week as well. Are members content that we have all of those three briefings then next week? Yeah. Great. Content? Okay. Great. And then um, Solace will be providing us with an update briefing at our meeting on the 24th of June and the department will also brief us on the reform of liquor licensing on the 24th of june also so members happy to note all of that great yep. great. Great. great okay um next uh, agenda item is agenda item number eight which is aob and carol i know that you had something you wanted to bring up yes um chair and with with colleagues on the committee um i i would like to ask if it's possible now notwithstanding all the briefings that we need to take but certainly that we ask the IFA um, for clarification on the letter that went out to clubs with the deadline, which a lot of the clubs felt was unreasonable. Um, and even some have, you know, talked about the tone as well. So, um, and, the, you know, I just think, like this is something that's went right across the community. I've had clubs from North Belfast, from right across, just contacting them us about you know what the situation is and i also think even just the the impact that it's going to have on the the um the, the furloughing of um staff at those clubs is immense so um sure i'm just asking if we could have um a written briefing from the ifa in the first instance um just on what the situation is because it's quite urgent yeah, and thank you for that, Carol. I did hear something about that on the news earlier as well, and I do understand that I mean, the decisions that are being made um, really will be the sustainability of some clubs out there um, going mm -hmm. forward. So, yes, definitely at the moment. I know we're fully packed up for next week and the week after, but I do think a written briefing um, would certainly be um, something that we could ask for um, mm -hmm. as to the rationale behind what they're trying to do. Um, so that was Grant. Johnny, did you want to come in on something there yeah. as well? Yeah, no, and I, I would support Carl's uh, call there in terms of whether it's a written brief, but I, I why I probably, I, th I suppose probably it's on certain times for any of the the league providers and how and how things will fur out given with COVID nineteen as to whether their season is technically rid off or, or what will be that case, and I suppose it has a lot of burns on a lot of clubs given their position and could that have changed? Um, so so yes, while while I would support. 
uh, the need for for a written briefing in relation to the rationale probably behind their decision making it would be good for the committee in terms of transparency and indeed probably for the other clubs i would be reluctant maybe to get involved in the internal processes of the the league body as to to how uh, or to, to what their decision making body the decision that they come to and, and how they move forward but i, I would actually and I, I, Carol would be happy to include this here I, I would actually think that albeit i know with COVID business at the minute but i do think that it would be useful for the committee at some stage to have a briefing from uh, the ifa because I, I do have some wider concerns regarding all the decision making uh, and processes that they have in place in regards to their management etc and, and i don't know if it would be useful for other members but i i certainly would like uh, to, to hear from them going in some time in the future i take it we can't do that maybe immediately but as soon as as is possible okay yeah. are you happy Agreed, enough there Carl, we add that Agreed. on as well yeah. yeah okay members any other business any other member wants to bring up mark durkins do you have your hand up mark are you there no no maybe not Okay, there doesn't appear to be Hello. Mark. Sorry, go ahead, Mark. Are we there? <laughs> I'm here. I you disappeared. Sorry about that, Paula. You're no, right. it was basically to come in in support of uh, Carl's proposal in terms of requesting that from the IFA. But I wonder, could we ask them as well or, or for an update on the situation with the, the Women's League? Because I don't think it, the club was only due to start in April. So there's particular uh, issues there as well. And sadly, it's still often an afterthought is women's sport so thanks mm -hmm. brilliant I'm, Very yep, good. all agreement on that yes everybody mm -hmm. yep agreed okay fry your hand is up on our screen here do you want to speak no. are you okay no <laughs> i never put my hand up <laughs> <laughs> we have a wee screen here that oh it's away it's gone gone now you're all right okay members thank you very much um i'll then go on to agenda item number nine which is date, time, location of next meeting. Um, next meeting then will take place uh, next Wednesday, the 17th of June, at the new time of 2 p.m. And that will take place in room 29. Can I thank members for their patience? And I think we've done pretty successful today. So thank you, members. Meeting closed. Thank, thank you. you thank you. 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 This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.